tonight's speaker is Gary Suretsky, whom many consider a rock star among archivists, and I know firsthand because I volunteered for Gary at the Monmouth County Archives for about six months, and I learned so much from him. He has 50 years of experience as an archivist and is a wonderful photographer and educator as well. So without further ado, please welcome Gary Suretsky. Hello, everyone. Um, Dana, I can't see myself here. Uh, I see you. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> I hope everybody else does too. Um, uh, good evening and uh, thank you, Dana, for uh, the nice introduction. And uh, also thank Monmouth County Historical Association and the Monmouth County Library for hosting this event. Um, my uh, task tonight is to uh, inform you about uh, Gustavus Pock and the, his brothers, the Pock brothers. Uh, I'm going to give you some biographical information about these folks, and then um, I'm going to show you a whole bunch of pictures that I hope you will enjoy. So I'm going to um, share screen. I see my daughter uh, has said she can see me, which is good. <laughs> Dana, can you see my title slide? Yes, I can. Okay, excellent. Okay, uh, Gustavus Pock was one of a number of young photographers who established their own galleries in New Jersey during the increased market for portraits during the Civil War. His career, uh, in, which included partnering with his brothers and establishing more than a dozen galleries in the Northeastern United States, uh, was characterized by both typical and unique experiences at a time when there was a high public demand for photographers to provide multiple copies of inexpensive portraits. As most of you know, photography was introduced in 1839 and initially um, the daguerre daguerreotype process was the predominant process, which was expensive and uh, they were one of a kind. Uh, and it was only in the 1850s with the introduction of uh, collodion processes that inexpensive paper prints became possible. And uh, coinciding with the uh, Civil War era, uh, there was a, um, an increased demand for these inexpensive uh, paper photographs uh, that were called carte de visites or visiting card photos. Um, and this was an era that's been called cartomania because uh, everybody wanted to get one of these or many of them. And uh, Civil War soldiers who were going off to fight, uh, they wanted to get pictures of themselves in case something happened to them. Uh, their families wanted pictures of them. The soldiers wanted pictures of their families uh, to take with them. And uh, so there was a huge boom of, uh, in the market for photographs. And uh, in New Jersey during the Civil War, um, there was over 200 uh, new galleries that opened up. And uh, Gustavus Pock opened up his gallery in the, excuse me, the telephone went off here. Um, hit, opened his gallery uh, right during the Civil War period. So Gustavus Pock was uh, one of uh, six brothers uh, his parents uh, came to the United States in the 1850s uh, from Berlin, Germany, where Gustavus was born uh, in 1845. And uh, they came before he did. Uh, he didn't arrive until uh, 1860, uh, when he was about 15. Uh, my guess is that he was in school and he, they, his parents wanted him to finish his schooling, but that's just speculation. I don't really know. Uh, his older brother, Morris, came in the early 1850s. And then there were these other brothers. Uh, we're not sure uh, about this Bernard, who was also known as Barney. I'm pretty sure he was a brother, uh, but not didn't get too involved with the business. Oscar, born in 1850, uh, didn't arrive until after serving in the Franco-Prussian War for the Prussians. Uh, so he didn't get to uh, the United States until the early 1870s. Uh, there was also another brother whose name I have not been able to find, 
But uh, this brother, the young brother, uh, Gotthelf, also known as Godfrey, uh, he became a very important part of the Pock brothers' operation. Uh, of these brothers, uh, Gustavus was the founder of the firm of Pock brothers. Uh, Gotthelf was a partner, and so became Oscar, who was uh, brought in primarily to run the financial aspects of the business, but he's listed as a photographer in census records. There, there also was another brother uh, because in, in some of the biographical accounts of the photographers, they mentioned that there was six brothers. I only know the name of five of them though. And there was a sister, Bertha Pock, who emigrated, but she went back to Berlin uh, at some point late, uh, in the 1890s. Uh, she owned property in Monmouth County. She sold it uh, for a dollar to uh, her brother Gustavus, and then she went back to Berlin. So all of these brothers were born in Germany. As I mentioned, five of them were involved with photography. The business began in the 1860s in uh, New York when uh, Gustavus and his brothers were uh, teenagers. Uh, they would uh, take pictures and uh, with the help of uh, volunteer firemen and firefighters, uh, I'm sorry, volunteer firefighters and uh, police officers, uh, they would uh, develop uh, their pictures and they learn how to, how to make photographs. Gustavus uh, got work as, uh, as, a, um, as soon as he came over here in, in 1860 at the age of 14, he uh, found work as a printer uh, in, a, in a photo lab. And uh, unfortunately, he developed a, um, a lung problem, possibly from exposure to photographic chemicals. And it was recommended that he go to the Jersey Shore for his health. And he went to Tom's River with his older brother, Morris, and they opened up a gallery in there. And that's their first known uh, New Jersey location. Uh, subsequently, uh, Gustavus briefly had a uh, partnered with another photographer in Eatontown, but uh, then goes back to New York, where uh, he uh, has a, he's listed in the 1866 uh, New York Directory as a photographer along with uh, his brother uh, Morris. Later on, he uh, comes to Long Branch, uh, and we'll get to that in a moment, and then later to Lakewood. So uh, Pac, uh, just to wrap up his kind of personal life, he, he doesn't marry uh, young. He, he doesn't get married until 1886 when he's over 40 years old. He marries a young woman named Tilly, and they have four children, three of whom survived. Uh, one of the ones who survived was a son that he named after his brother, uh, Oscar. And uh, that son, Oscar, became uh, a photographer in Cleveland. So here's a photo of the three most important brothers who were involved in the Pock brothers business. That's Godhelf or Godfrey on the left, Gustavus, also known as Augustus in the center and Oscar on the right. These brothers uh, uh, seem to have on occasion tried to anglicize uh, their names, uh, to perhaps to try to fit in better with uh, American society. So, uh, after operating in Long Branch, uh, Gustavus opens up another uh, uh, studio in New York, which actually continues until 1993. So altogether, uh, this uh, POC business uh, was in existence for about 130 years. In addition to the uh, New York studio, uh, they were also in many other locations. I mentioned Tom's River already, and then he, later on he goes to Lakewood. But uh, he had studios in Ocean Grove, in a lot of the Ivy League towns, uh, like uh, Cambridge for, where, Har for Harvard, New Haven for Yale. Uh, there was a branch in Easton, Pennsylvania. Well, I'll show you an example later from that one. Uh, Poughkeepsie, which is where they photographed uh, students from Vassar. Uh, Princeton, where they had the contract for um, photographing the classes of Princeton University for uh, more than 20 years. And at, this, at that same location, they also photographed Lawrenceville School uh, students and faculty. Uh, they also photographed at West Point and uh, some other places. Here's an ad from 1877 
where um, they mentioned that they've gotten the contracts for uh, West Point, Yale, and Harvard, and they're expecting to make 90,000 uh, photographs of individuals and groups uh, that they said heretofore was given to operators in Canada. They're referring there to the major Canadian photographer, William Notman, who also did a lot of class photos for these Ivy League uh, schools. So they got the contract away from Notman uh, and they, they had a very good business. And by 1879, they had contracts for 130,000 photos. Here's a price list from the Daily Princetonian. I might mention that in the Daily Princetonian, there's 2,000 mentions of Gustavus Pock uh, coming to campus. Uh, so he was, th he was there quite a bit over the years. Uh, the, uh, the prices here were actually fairly reasonable compared to uh, some of the other prices that they charged in for, uh, for people just coming into the studio and having a picture made. I'll show you an example of that later. Um, that you can see here that uh, for a dollar, you could get an 11 by 14 uh, class picture. And then today's money, well, in 2014 money, uh, that was $28. It's a little bit more now. Uh, here's, a, here's a statement from the Ocean Grove record. Uh, Pac would come in the summer. And uh, so they say the arrival of Pac, uh, the celebrated photographer at his handsome Ocean Grove establishment last week was an event to be noted. His salon is always a place of popular resort on account of the urbanity and extreme politeness with which he and his assistants treat everybody. So to be a successful photographer, you had to have not only good technical skills, but you had to have good social skills as well. And of course, that's still true today. Here's another quote from the Ocean Grove record that Pac had a rotund and smiling countenance. So you get a little sense of what kind of a guy he was. In addition to uh, photographing uh, by daylight, uh, Pac also in the 1890s uh, began photographing using flash. And uh, he would do that to photograph building interiors. Uh, the New York Times reported on December 23rd, 1897, that Gustavus was injured by an explosion of flash powder while photographing Little Chapel attached to Grace Protestant Episcopal Church at Broadway and 10th Street. The cause was a mistake by his assistant who used an explosive powder as an ingredient in the magnesium powder used to uh, create the flash. Uh, Pock's hand was treated at St. Vincent's Hospital and he went back to work later that day, but his firm had to replace six stained glass windows, which were blown out by the blast. In 1896, uh, Pock established a branch in Lakewood and within a year he had a place to live there. So he, he established his home there as well. And in 1903, he bought out the New Jersey portion of the business from Pock Brothers, which then was continued by his brother, God help. Uh, Oscar had died uh, or died just about the same time as this occurred. So God help continued running that branch uh, into the 1920s and then the New York branch. And then uh, his, his son, uh, after his death, uh, took over for him into the 1940s. So Gustavus died fairly young. He was 59. Uh, he had cancer and he had an operation at uh, Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. Um, I don't know details of it, but to me, it sounds like the operation was a success, but the patient died. Uh, at his funeral, uh, it was well attended, uh, including by some of his, um, uh, his, um, uh, his employees, some of whom had been uh, working for him for tw up to 20 years. Uh, one fellow who was his printer. Uh, I worked for him for that long by the time he died and continued working uh, for the Pock firm uh, until his death. Um, the obituary mentions that his funeral was attended by uh, the uh, Independent Order of Free Sons of Israel. And uh, Gustavus and the Pocks uh, did come from a Jewish-German uh, background. Uh, they were not uh, uh, religious, uh, but uh, they, di they didn't uh, give up, their, at least Gustavus didn't give up his Jewish identity. Uh, I've been informed by uh, Karen Schnitzpan, one of our esteemed local historians of Monmouth County, that um, 
some of the family became involved with the ethical culture movement of Felix Adler, which was very appealing uh, for secular Jews. Uh, and there were schools, ethical culture schools, uh, that some of these uh, people ended up uh, giving their, uh, sending their children to. The Free Sons of Israel was established in 1851 by German immigrant Jews. Uh, Pak was buried in Cypress Hill Cemetery in Brooklyn, uh, where there are also other family members. So uh, that's a quick summary of um, the Pak brothers, and I'll give you a little more information about them as we go along. But I want to turn now to the uh, photographs because that's the, the main reason I think that you're all here. Uh, and I'll be showing some examples of uh, photos from the Monmouth County Historical Association's uh, collection, as well as from some other sources, uh, including uh, some private collections. Here's an advertising card for the Pock brothers. In 1868, uh, Gustavus uh, was based in Long Branch at that time. He was being assisted by his younger brother, uh, got help because his older brother Morris had uh, moved to Red Bank and opened up a tobacco shop. He was quite successful there, eventually became an alderman in, in Red Bank. Um, in 1868, Pock uh, did the photographs for a book about Long Branch. Uh, these were large prints that were pasted into the book, uh, so the, they didn't have a good means of photo reproduction back then. Uh, what, the halftone hadn't yet been developed. So uh, these are original albumin prints that are mounted right into the book. And one of them was of Pock's own uh, gallery. And you can see here, he's got his, uh, his wagon on the right that he would use to uh, go around and take pictures of, uh, of houses and people. And he also start, was starting to make stereographic views, which we'll see examples of. Uh, there's a nice group in the center there. And uh, there's a photographer who's uh, set up to take an outdoor picture of them uh, on the left. Next to the door, there's his showcase, which shows examples of uh, some of his work. And you can also see that the, uh, the roof has a skylight and there's a large window below it so that they could take photographs indoors. Here's uh, that wagon again. And uh, here it's a stereographic view uh, thank Ken Rosen of Monmouth County for making some of the stereographic views you'll see tonight available. Um, and uh, if we zoom in on that wagon, we can see that uh, he now has a, uh, a New York address. This is uh, 858 Broadway. And so this is from the 1870s. And then not so visible, but um, below the big sign, Along the, the bottom of the carriage, there is mention of Long Branch, Ocean Grove, West Point, and Poughkeepsie. Here's another of his uh, studios. And, and, and this is from uh, George Moss, uh, his, his book. He was um, an esteemed Monmouth County historian. And uh, I'll mention him again uh, as we go along. But uh, this is another of his studios uh, in Long Branch. And he had, uh, Pac had many different uh, studios in Monmouth County, especially Long Branch, uh, Asbury area or Ocean Grove, primarily Ocean Grove, but they kept changing locations all the time. Here's one that was at the west end of Long Branch. And here we're looking at a map from 1890. And there's a big, there's the ocean is at the bottom. And there's a big hotel complex along the ocean. And then on the side street, Brighton Avenue, uh, there is Pox Gallery right um, uh, near the West End Amusement Hall. This is what that uh, gallery looked like. Um, it was in operation for decades. And uh, Pock had another photographer named Norris Halsey who was uh, running that gallery. He, at the time of uh, Gustavus's death, he'd been there for 25 years. I don't know how much longer he stayed after that. Here's another Puck uh, studio. This one is from the Ross Pavilion, which is an ocean, it was an ocean grove, but it's located right between Ocean Grove and Asbury Park. So those of you who are familiar with that area, you walk along the boardwalk, you go from Ocean Grove right into Asbury, 
And this is right in that section that's right near the border of the two of the two towns. You can see the skylight at the extreme right there for the studio. One of his studios was on Wesley Lake, which is in between Ocean Grove and Asbury Park. And that particular studio, the building was moved and now it's a private residence in Ocean Grove. It's had quite a few changes made to it. In New York, I mentioned earlier that uh, briefly, uh, Gustavus and Morris had a studio in 1866 and 67. And then Gustavus established the long-term studio again in New York in 1871 on, on, on Broadway. And this is a list of all the known locations uh, of that business in New York. And you can see that for some periods that it lasted longer than others. And then there are some years that uh, there was more than one location simultaneously. Uh, about halfway down, you'll see the 1901 to 1911, the Windsor Arcade was a building that the Pox owned. Uh, they, it was built after a fire destroyed the previous building at that location at the corner of Fifth Avenue and 46th Street. And they had a gallery in that building. Way down at the bottom, you'll see that's the end of the Pock Brothers firm. Um, Oscar White became a partner in the firm with the last Pock uh, who was involved with it. Um, and uh, then he took over and became the, the president of uh, Pock Brothers. And then he closed the studio when he retired in 1993. So it lasted a long time in, in New York. So I'm going to show you now um, examples of POC photos from with different by format. Uh, I'm going to first start out with carte de visites, and then we'll see some of the other formats that um, that they worked in. So here's uh, uh, an early carte de visite from uh, to the Tom's River, and you can see on the back it says G and M POC, and uh, this is a Civil War, obviously a Civil War soldier. Uh, some of the early uh, carte de visites, or CDVs for short, have an eagle motif on the back, which is very consistent, you know, with the Civil War period. Uh, you see that uh, patriotic uh, design. Here's two different, uh, two different portraits. Uh, same hat, uh, same chair. And if we look on the back, that same design again. Uh, after operating in, in Tom's River uh, and the Pac uh, Gustavus then you know, set up in, in Long Branch, but he, he did go back to Tom's River and briefly operate another gallery there uh, so, uh, in the 1870s. Oops, sorry about that. This one has some hand applied color. Very solemn looking young lad. Now here's one uh, very early uh, Long Branch uh, CDV. He, this gentleman is sitting in a photographer's posing chair. It had an adjustable arm so that you could move it to either side. You could have it in the back as a backrest or sometimes you even see them uh, posing with the arm, that arm in the front. It was introduced about 1864. Now, here's one from the early 1870s, and you can see now there's two addresses on the back of the card, and it still says G.W. Pock. It doesn't say Pock Brothers. So even though the brothers were involved, Gustavus was running the show, uh, and uh, so only his name is on this, as this one. Now here's one that's a little later, and now he's already opened up a branch in Ocean Grove, so that it, all three are mentioned on the back of this card, which was damaged, so I'm not gonna show it to you, uh, but it has all three names on the back. And here's a, at a later address, 841 Broadway from the late 1880s. Here's one where you can see the back, and uh, this one is from their Poughkeepsie, uh, studio. So Poughkeepsie is, is featured at the top of the list of uh, places. And then it says also at New York, West Point, Long Branch, and Ocean Grove. 
All right, now let's turn to stereographic views. Uh, Hawk is, is probably best known for the stere his stereographic views. The, they're mostly from Monmouth County. And uh, George Moss, uh, who lived in Rumson, had a large collection of these stereo views, which is now at Monmouth University. But while he was alive, he made color copies of them, which are at the Monmouth County Historical Association. And there are many examples of these uh, in, in public and private collections. He made hundreds of different views. And in, in George Moss's book, uh, Double Exposure Two, he has a list of the views that he knew about. Uh, some of them were numbered and there are gaps in the numbering for ones that he hadn't found. Uh, other collectors have found examples that are not listed in, in George's book, but George's book currently is still the, the best list available, uh, published list available of uh, POC stereo views. Uh, so this is a typical stereographic view and um, those of you who are not familiar with this format, uh, those, it's a paper print mounted on cardboard, three and a half by seven inches. And when put into a viewer, it looks three-dimensional. Uh, photographers who photographed in stereo would try to place something in, in focus in the extreme foreground, like the boat in this case, and that would help uh, give you that 3D look when you look through the viewer. So he had a series that was called Long Branch and Vicinity, um, but he also did others, as you'll see, uh, by the, the imprints on the side. Uh, this one was a very popular one. So he actually had on the left there, you see President Grant at his cottage by the sea printed on the card. So you know that he must have made a lot of these uh, to take the trouble to print the, the information. And he also copyrighted this. Uh, so you can see it mentions that he, uh, filed it with the Office of the Librarian of Congress at Washington in 1872. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant uh, played a major role in Pock's success uh, because when he first came to Long Branch, he was operating out of a wagon with his younger brother, uh, Gotthalf, and uh, he photographed Grant and uh, Grant said, uh, you know, you did a good job, but where's your studio? And Gustavo said, no, I don't have a studio. I just have this wagon. So uh, Grant arranged with uh, some wealthy friends of his um, and there's different versions of the story, but uh, one version said that the, the story, the friends were George Childs and Anthony Drexel and that they put up the money. Uh, to lo they loaned uh, Gustavus the money to set up his first studio in Long Branch. Uh, accounts vary whether Grant also put up some of the money, some, some versions he did, some he didn't, uh, but Grant definitely was instrumental in getting Pac uh, started in Long Branch. So Pac went around and he photographed uh, people's summer cottages. Um, I was always, I'm always impressed by the size of what they thought it was a cottage. Um, but, uh, and then on the back, you can see here, this is an, uh, has a handwritten title and it's number 204. Uh, so a lot of his early pictures, um, he probably wasn't planning to sell a lot of these. They probably mostly for the owner of the building or the cottage. Uh, so he just had a blank label and he'd fill it in. Uh, when he was photographing views that uh, he thought maybe m many people would buy, then um, gradually he started having, um, you know, printed, printed uh, titles on them, like the Grant view that we just saw. This is uh, probably somewhere in Long Branch. It's on a Long Branch and vicinity uh, series card, but it does, we don't know specifically where this place was. At least I don't. Maybe somebody else out there does. Here's a young African-American lad uh, on the beach. Uh, one wonders why he photographed this fellow. Uh, did, he, did he think that he could sell some copies of this? And if so, uh, perhaps this uh, person was somebody that was well known uh, to summer uh, vacationers in the area. He made a lot of uh, 
um, stereo views taken in Ocean Grove. These, these are tremendous value historically uh, for people interested in the history of that town. It's just such a special place. Uh, as I think at least those of you who are in New Jersey uh, know, uh, the, it was founded as a Methodist uh, camp meeting and that uh, initially um, people came in the summer and they lived in tents and uh, they still are tents uh, today that people use. Um, this is another uh, gallery uh, in Ocean Grove by pa of Pox. This gallery is not in this view, but the, this ocean pathway is definitely still there and it looks something like this today. Here's a, 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 one of the tents. Uh, this one is identified on the back as Mr. Reeves' tent which is interesting because uh, here's another version of the same photo, oops, sorry about that, uh, that's at the New York Public Library where it's identified as Mrs. Stone's tent and all the same people are in it. It's the same exact, it's from the same negative. So um, I take it that Mrs. Stone and this other fellow both had some interest in this place. Uh, Pac uh, apparently uh, decided that the more people he could get into a photograph, the better chance he had of selling copies. So when he would go to these different uh, summer hotels, he would try to get as many people to come out and have their picture included. This is half of a uh, stereographic view from a series called Scenes at Ocean Grove. Here's another one, Scenes of Ocean Grove in Asbury Park. Um, the Ocean Grove Auditorium has uh, been around uh, for a long time, but the current one was uh, built in the 1890s. There were a couple before that. This is one from the late 1870s, which at that time you can see was an open air uh, covered space. Here's the janitor's tent. See, so you got a lot of a lot of people in this photo, and they're they're looking at him, you know. So somehow or another, he got all their attention uh, without uh, a microphone, since you know they didn't have microphones back then. Uh, he, he got all these people to look at him. Here's a, a beach meeting, uh, probably a religious meeting uh, on the beach. You can see everybody's dressed fully dressed here. They're not in their in bathing attire, that's for sure. Here's a view of uh, the main street in Ocean Grove. And you can see on the main street that there are two horse-drawn vehicles. Um, and if we zoom in to the area between the two vehicles, there's another of Pox galleries. And as far as I know, he only had one at a time in Ocean Grove. Um, so, my impression is that he, they must have moved around uh, year to year. This is half a stereo view. Uh, this is the Iron Pier in, uh, in Long Branch uh, where ferries from New York would come and bring tourists uh, who would come for stays from one day to the summer. And there was a huge amount of traffic coming in. Here's the old Monmouth Park, not the one that's there now. Um, gambling was um, made illegal in New Jersey and uh, the old Monmouth Park, this one was uh, eventually torn down. Um, th uh, this is one of my favorite uh, Pac views. Uh, th there's a, apparently a race that's going on here and uh, the horses are lined up behind the fence so that they can watch the race. I, 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 I'm thinking that maybe they knew the horses who were running and uh, that they were, they were in a good position to uh, enjoy what happened. Uh, this slide by Pac uh, of the South Dock um, in the distance there on the Hudson River is part of his series that he did on West Point. And uh, Pac uh, did many views in the Hudson River Valley, especially uh, a big series on, on West Point. And uh, he also photographed extensively in uh, New York and other areas. 
This is the Cypress Hills uh, in, Cemetery in Brooklyn, where Pac was uh, buried after he died. And this is a series that he did on uh, Sing Sing Prison. He photographed both the men's prison and the women's prison. Pac did a, a, a major series on Central Park in New York. Uh, he photographed uh, also many buildings in New York and uh, streets. He photographed uh, the Brooklyn Navy Yard. He photographed steamships, uh, passenger ships going out to sea. Uh, this is a view of the Five Points area, which was uh, kind of a slum uh, area in the Lower East Side of New York. Um, some years after this was taken, the Brooklyn Bridge had its terminus uh, on the Manhattan side uh, near here. And he also photographed many schools in New York, uh, both interior, interior views showing students in class, as well as exterior group shots. Now I'd like to turn to the uh, glass negative collection at the Monmouth County Historical Association. Uh, in 1963, uh, local historian George Moss uh, bought 5,000 glass plate negatives from George J. Morris, who was the son of George Morris, who uh, became the chief photographer for Pac after Pac died. And uh, George J. Morris had about 15,000 of these glass plates in the garage. Uh, about 1992, local historian Karen Schnitzpan purchased 1,190 glass plate negatives and one film negative uh, from a dealer, uh, presumably uh, somebody who had acquired them from this uh, garage collection. And both uh, Moss and Schnitzpan generously donated their collections to the Monmouth County Historical Association, which thus now has more than 6,000 uh, negatives from the Pac studio. Uh, there's also another major collection uh, of Pac negatives at the Museum of the City of New York. Oscar White, the, who was not a member of the family, but was the last president of Pac Brothers in New York, when he retired, he donated uh, 75,000 negatives to the Museum of the City of New York. Uh, so there are major collections of Pac's work uh, in uh, these, these two places, MCHA and um, the Museum of the City of New York. But there are also collections of his uh, views in other places like the New York Public Library, uh, the Ocean County uh, Historical, uh, I'm sorry, the Ocean, Ocean Grove Historical Society, and uh, the Monmouth University, as I mentioned previously, has uh, George Moss's um, stereographic view collection, uh, which is uh, heavily uh, of POC. Uh, so now I'll turn to the um, glass plate negatives from a selection from the Monmouth County Historical Association. Um, and we don't have a lot of information other than the title, uh, but I hope uh, that just for visual enjoyment, you, you find them worthwhile looking at. These uh, um, ones that we're looking at are from 11 by 14 inch glass plate negatives. So the detail is amazing. Here's uh, the Breakers Hotel at Spring Lake. That's... This is one from that Windsor Arcade that I mentioned earlier. But I think most of these are from the um, Long Branch and Lakewood locations.
This is one from uh, the Lawrenceville School. Uh, the Pock firm had a, um, had a studio in Princeton near uh, the railroad station. And uh, Pock would go to the Lawrenceville School campus to photograph, but when he, he wanted to do a formal portrait, uh, they would come to Princeton. And there was a streetcar from Lawrenceville to Princeton, so they could get there that way. So both faculty and students went to Princeton from Lawrenceville to have their portraits made. This is uh, from a, a military and Wild West show. Here's one that we, we can have a good sense of what the date was because it's uh, P.T. Barnum, uh, the impresario, who died in 1891. So it must predate, of course, uh, his death. Um, it's a it's a wonderful photograph. I just wish we could see the face of the uh, the girl who was under the horse there. Uh, that's to me that's the only flaw of the picture. Okay, here's uh, George J. Gould. Uh, he was the son of J. Gould, who was uh, you know one of the richest men in America, and. Uh, George Shagul had this huge estate at Georgian Court uh, in Lakewood. This is not, however, Georgian Court, but here he is, and they're going to have this hunt. And you can see all the dogs are waiting for their instructions. Most of them are, are looking at him, uh, waiting, for, waiting for him to say what to do, although some of the ones in the back aren't paying sufficient attention. Here is uh, the Gould residence at Georgian Court now Georgian Court University. Here's uh, Mrs. Gould's bedroom. And uh, here are the Gould children at a colonial ball at Georgian Court. I'm gonna show you some more pictures of um, the Goulds uh, when we get to the next section. One of, one of the Guggenheims, I'm not sure which one though. Okay, let's go to the cabinet cards now. Uh, the cabinet card was a larger version of the carte de visite. Uh, it's, as you can see here, it, they were four and a quarter by six and a half inches. Uh, carte de visites continue to be made in the United States. Uh, they were still fairly popular in the 1880s, but in that decade, cabinet cards superseded them in popularity. Uh, by 1900, very few carte de visites were made in the United States, but they continued to be uh, made in Europe. So here's uh, one from uh, the New Haven Gallery. Um, although it, it says it has a New York address on the back. Um, and then it mentions the branches uh, below it, uh, Long Branch, Ocean Grove, New Haven and Middletown, Connecticut, West Point and Poughkeepsie, Cambridge and Williamstown, Massachusetts, Easton, Pennsylvania, Princeton, Clinton, uh, which is where Hamilton College is, and Ithaca, uh, where Cornell is. Uh, so by the early 1880s, they, they, were, they had a lot of different uh, branches. Here's another one from uh, the class of 82. Uh, And some uh, just just wonderful uh, portraits from uh, this one is from the, the New York uh, studio. Uh, towards the end of the century, they started doing more uh, portraits of entertainers, which the entertainers could then use uh, to promote themselves.
here we have the sons of uh, George J. Gould, who were uh, among the best polo players in America as teenagers. Uh, Gould had a, a polo field at Georgian Court and also an enormous indoor area where they could um, practice uh, polo and other things. Uh, it, and it's like an indoor polo field. It's a huge room. Uh, so this is a portrait of the two sons of Jay Gould and the grandsons, uh, the sons of George Jay and the grandsons of Jay, taken in 1900. I don't think I need to read all the captions for you because I think you could see them pretty well. Now I'm going to make it a little guessing game here. Uh, see if you you know who this is. Uh, at least one of them. It's Buffalo Bill Cody there on the left. Big stars who. Uh, for many are now forgotten. Here's uh, Senator John Kane of the, the Kane family that uh, also gave us uh, Governor Tom Kane not too long ago. Okay, let's take a look at some larger prints uh, and other kinds of photos. Now this is one uh, on a George, uh, Gustavus Pock, uh, New York and Long Branch Mount that's at the New Jersey State Archives. The fellow in the uh, top white hat is Governor Joel Parker. Uh, during his second term, he, he had two non-consecutive terms as New Jersey governor, the first during the Civil War. So this is taken in the 1870s during his second term. And uh, just to, uh, to our, our left, on the extreme left of the photo, sitting very close to um, Governor Parker is Gen Adjutant General William Stryker who compiled all the information about New Jersey soldiers who have served in the revolution as well as in the Civil War. And his, his compilations are invaluable for people doing research on uh, New Jersey men and units uh, who have served uh, in, those, in, those, in that period. He also was instrumental in developing the collection of carte de visite portraits of New Jersey Civil War soldiers that is at the uh, New Jersey State Archives. Here's a, a larger view of uh, Grant. Um, this one also has a printed title at the bottom, uh, General Grant and Family. You can see two African-American uh, servants in the background. Uh, Pac took the uh, first uh, photograph of a president meeting with his cabinet. And I could not find an original uh, of that, but it was reproduced in Harper's Weekly in 1879. There had been previous portraits of a president with cabinet members taken in photography studios, um, going back to the Daguerrean era. But this was the first time that a photographer actually went into the room where they were meeting and took a photograph. Here's a, a Yale group and another Yale group. This one, the bicyclists. In addition to the carte de visite and the cabinet card, there were many other formats in the 19th century. Neither, none of them as popular as those two, but one of them was the boudoir card, which is sort of an elongated cabinet card. Ramrod Strait, aren't they? Okay, here's one uh, by Alex Pock, who uh, ran the Eastern Pennsylvania branch in the early 1890s. Now, Alex Pock, uh, who was profiled in uh, Portrait Magazine, uh, which was published by uh, the, the camera manufacturer uh, Anscombe uh, in 1917, uh, it's an interesting guy in itself, in himself, because uh, he he went uh, completely deaf when he was uh, seventeen, and uh, he then attended uh, Galladay um, to learn about 
how to how to manage and in his uh, disability and uh, he became a leader of the deaf community uh, in New York um, and uh, at one point he declined an offer to become president of the Deaf Mutes Association of New Jersey. Here's another uh, view by Alex Pock. Uh, at this time he was working for Pock Brothers but in the early 1900s he set out on his own and he established the Pock Photograph Company on Broadway, which had no connection to Pock Brothers on Fifth Avenue, which is where the Pock Brothers was located at that time. Here's a, a copy of a painting by the Pock Brothers of Jay Gould, uh, the, the financier. And here is uh, his son, George J, uh, with his family, uh, including those two sons that we saw earlier, the polo players, and uh, his wife and uh, two daughters. As, as some of you may know, George J. Gould also had a, another family uh, with uh, a girlfriend of his. And after his wife died, he, he married that other woman, uh, but then he died so shortly thereafter. Here's another one for you to guess. This is Ferdinand Roebling, the bridge builder. It's Grover Cleveland. Now, this was made in 1904 after Gustavus Pock uh, so, uh, bought out the New Jersey interests of the Pock brothers uh, in 1903. And it's also the same year that uh, Gustavus died. So this is uh, a very late portrait um, by Gustavus um, before his death. And he went into New York to make this photograph. Uh, so I, mean, I, I know that because he initialed it on the back. So apparently, even though he was no longer in charge of that New York uh, studio, um, for somebody who, as important as a former president, uh, Gustavus went and took his picture. Here's Admiral Dewey, the hero of the Spanish-American War. You all must know this fellow. And perhaps this guy, this guy, J. Pierpont Morgan. Maybe less familiar, but a familiar name. Edward Harriman, president of the Union Pacific. How about this fellow? When he was young, he lived to a great age. So I'm going to wrap this up and then I'll be glad to take some questions. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, quick uh, survey of uh, the range of photographs that uh, the Pock, uh, Gustavus Pock and the Pock brothers uh, made. And uh, hopefully um, there'll be more information that'll come up later about them. Um, if you're interested in the Pocks, these are uh, some of the sources that you could go to. Um, those Innocent Years by Moss and Schnitzpan uh, has a lot of images from the later period of the Pock firm. Uh, I mentioned earlier Double Exposure, which uh, is the best current source for uh, Pock stereographic views. And the third item here is a biography of Walter Pock, who was one of the sons of Gotthelf Pock. Uh, one son went on to run the Pock brothers business, but Walter became an artist and, and an art historian. And the early part of this book talks about the history of the family. 
So that's a good source uh, for that. So thank you very much. Oh, what happened here? Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I think Dana will uh, field questions. Yeah, Gary, that was great. Thank you so much. Beautiful pictures. Thank you. The clarity is amazing, right? And those glass plates, I just can't get over it. Yep. <laughs> Okay, hold on one second. Let me share my screen. Before we get to the Q and A, um, hold on, let's see. I just wanna remind everybody uh, about our upcoming presentation by Freehold Borough historian, journalist, and award-winning author, Kevin Coyne. He'll be presenting on three influential men across three centuries, 18th century Nathaniel Scudder. He was the only sitting member of Congress to die in battle. 19th century William Dayton, who was a Princeton educated freehold lawyer who was appointed by President Lincoln as ambassador to France. And another guy from freehold, 20th century Mr. Bruce Springsteen, who needs no introduction. So trust me, Kevin is fantastic and you won't wanna miss him. Um, that is, it's a Tuesday, not a Thursday. I know we usually do Thursdays, but this is Tuesday, June 15th. So let's get to Q and A with Gary. Hold on. Where did my chat go? Oh boy, okay, well, we got a lot of questions. First of all, did you say, Gary, that you didn't know where the Long Branch um, studio was? Um, I didn't say it because uh, I think it moved around. Okay, yeah, I couldn't find it. I was looking, somebody had asked and I was looking in the directories and I found one, um, I think it was the 1896 directory. Mm -hmm. Was and it said um, Brighton Avenue below Second Avenue in West End. Well, I did show that West End one. Okay. But I think there was another one that was not at West End. Okay. But that's one of the questions that I have too: is where were these galleries? Where were I they? Showed, yeah. I showed pictures of them, but I don't know what the street address was of those places. Right. There's, there's a lot that I don't know about the Pox. Well, you know where the Ocean Grove one was. You said right. Well, there were some of them, yeah, there, there was one on Main Street, we know that, and there was one at the Ross Pavilion, but then there were several others that, there, there was one at, uh, probably another one at Wesley Lake, other than the Ross Pavilion one, mm -hmm. but um, again, these are, these are still questions that need to be answered. Right. Okay, so, hmm, somebody was asking um, how the photos from well, actually, she put 1810, but she wants to know um, how the photos are preserved. So do you want to tell her how the photos are preserved? Well, th that's a tough question because I give a whole talk just on how to preserve photographs. You know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> in general. <laughs> in general, you want to keep them cool, uh, out of the light, and, and, and under, you know, reasonably low humidity conditions, but not too dry. So um, cooler, the better, uh, under 50% relative humidity and uh, in archival uh, sleeves and boxes. Uh, yep. that's, that's, that's the best thing you can do for them. Okay, yeah. Same thing with our glass plates. Okay, so I th it looked like so many questions, but really everybody's just like clapping their hands and saying how wonderful you are. <laughs> yeah. um, oh. I'm, I'm looking at the questions too. Uh, mostly they're complimentary, which uh, for which I appreciate them. Thank you very much. Um, I should have said hounds instead of dogs. Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> can show my knowledge of hunting is not too good. Uh, um, Mary's asking if she saw a mortuary photo, the mother and three children. I don't think so. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I didn't see that either. Um, How long sure. did someone have to sit for a carte de visite portrait? Um, not not long. It's a it's a it's a fraction of a second uh, back in those days uh, for to for to expose the negative. Uh, to get your picture, though, if for a carte de visite, you'd have to come back another day in all likelihood because they would then develop the negative and then they would print it in the sun. Uh, they would typically have four, um, four pictures on one negative. Uh, the camera, they had cameras in those days that would take four at a time or one at a time 
on one glass plate. And then they would be printed uh, on out in the sun. So you would come back, you know, they would develop the print and then, well, it wasn't developed. It was, it just had to stay out in the sun until the picture appeared. Then they would fix it so it wouldn't continue to darken in the light. And then it would be dried and then it would be glued onto or pasted onto cardboard. Um, so that, that was the process for carte de visite portraits. Um, for a tintype, uh, I, I haven't really found tintypes made by the pox, but they, they probably also did that early on. As, you know, like in Tom's River, they definitely advertised them. Uh, for a tintype, you could leave in 15 minutes with your tintype because that was the object that was in the camera. So that would be developed and, and dried, and then it would be presented to the customer before they left. It's almost like leaving with the negative. Yeah, kind like of. It's, yeah. it's much closer to like uh, Polaroid, you know, uh, instant photography because mm -hmm. you know it just had to be developed, and then you what was in the camera is what you what you ended up with. Mm -hmm. Whereas with uh, negative positive processes, you take the the positive home, and the photographer keeps the negative. Here's a good question. We were just talking about how expensive the. Um, the Pock Brothers photography actually was, right? Yeah, uh, so. I, I was gonna get back to that and I, I didn't. Um, I, I came across uh, uh, in, in 1913, uh, there was, uh, I came across the charge for um, a portrait, an eight by 10 portrait by the Pock Brothers. And in today's dollars, it was a little over $200. Yeah. Not cheap. Uh, so no, not not cheap. So mm -hmm. the people that they were photographing tended to be um, people who were, you know, middle class or above, um, or maybe upper middle class and above. So uh, Michael is asking, um, did the subjects generally ask Pac to take a photo for pay? Which would be yes, but he said, were there instances where Pac asked to take a subject's photo? Which I would imagine, yeah, probably, right. Yeah, I go back to that one of the African American young young man. Uh, I don't think he he hired Pac to take his stereo view. Mm -hmm. I, th I think Pac saw him and thought, you know, or maybe pa he said, "Take my picture," and Pac said, "Okay, I'll do it." You know, but uh, he wasn't hired to do it. I don't think uh, he paid Pac for that. But most most of the portraits that we see were portraits for hire. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe some of the, you know, I don't know, Grover Cleveland paid for his. Maybe they did that just as, you know, they were honored to do it. But um, I would say most of them were pictures for hire. That was so cool to see Irving Berlin young like that. Um, okay, so Amy's asking, did portrait painters ever employ photographers to take photos of their subjects for additional reference? I'm sure that happened. Um, but I didn't see any reference to Pac specifically doing that. Uh, but what he did do was make photographic copies of painted portraits, as we saw with that Jay Gould image. Okay. Um, Jerry's asking if the negatives or the plates at MCHA are digitized and is there an index? We have um, a part, there's about 800 of them that are digitized. It was through a Rutgers grant project. So, they're just not accessible online at this time, but we do have them here. So if you want to come and see them, you're you're welcome to come and see them. The the um, images are like super high quality tips. So they're impossible to to email. Right. Well, actually, I emailed some to you, right, Gary? Yeah. They're just huge. Yeah, they're just really big files. So some of them are, and then we have thousands that are not. So that's kind of on next on my list. Yeah, there's such an opportunity now you know, to go forward with this. Uh, you know, I, I remember George Moss um, giving presentations about Pac 30 years ago. Mm. And, uh, you know, there's been interest in him for a long time, but uh, there's still ways to go to, to, to make his, their work really accessible. There's a lot, a lot could be done with it. Clint is asking if you're continuing to work on the definitive list of New Jersey photographers and how can he help? Oh, very kind of you. Uh, if if you, I have a list on my on my webpage, Soretsky.com, of more than three thousand nineteenth-century New Jersey photographers. Uh, if someone sees of 
if they know of a photographer who's not on the list, uh, please get in touch with me. I'd be glad to add them. And also, if you if you have a copy, you can make a copy of a photo by one of these people. That uh, I I'm collecting digital copies, you know, of such photos as well as originals. Okay. So anybody, do we miss anybody? Up. Oh, somebody's asking, do we know the fate of the sister that moved back to Berlin? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> And that raises an interesting question is, you know, to what extent did they break their ties with Germany? Uh, Morris was naturalized. Uh, the father was naturalized. But uh, in the 1900 census, uh, Gustav, the, Gust, it's not indicated whether Gustavus was naturalized. And that, there was, that was one column in the census to indicate whether you were and what the date was when you were. And that column was left blank. Hmm. So, uh, Don't I, you love that, that missing piece of information? It's so much fun. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and I didn't find his naturalization on Ancestry or in the Monmouth County Archives, uh, you know, anyplace else. So it's possible that he was never naturalized. Mm -hmm. Maybe he was thinking about going back to Germany when he retired. I, you know, I don't know. John is saying that his copy of the stereo of the young black boy on the shore um, has the handwritten title on the reverse, Solid Comfort. I don't know. An unusual name for somebody. But mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe that was- Was he near a boat? No. Well, on the- It sounds like a boat name, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't think there was a, maybe there was a boat pulled up on the shore somewhere. I don't know, I'd have to see it again. Yeah, I would too. All right, well, thank you so much. Tonight was wonderful. Good. Learned well, a lot. All right, glad you enjoyed it. And thank you everybody for coming. I appreciate the attendance and hope to see you again sometime. All right, have a good night. Thank you everybody. Thank you, bye-bye.